Let me begin by saying in no uncertain terms, the EU has an unshakable commitment to the people of Northern Ireland to ensure that the peace, stability, and prosperity they have enjoyed over the last 20 years is preserved. This commitment is long-standing, unwavering, and runs deep in our DNA. The European Union is at heart the peace project uh, itself. I will never forget the images I saw 23 years ago of the signing ceremony of the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. Nor will I forget the hope that flourished from the day onwards and which subsequently established peace and stability for everyone in Northern Ireland and across the island of Ireland. We have supported uh, this process in Northern Ireland through the peace program with almost a billion euros in funding since its creation in 1995. And we will not allow this historical achievement to be lost. Let me be clear. Brexit, more precisely, the type of Brexit that the current UK government has chosen poses unique challenges to this unique situation. And the protocol represents the one and only solution we could jointly find to protect the hard-earned gains of peace process in Northern Ireland. Through countless hours of intense, line-by-line -line negotiations, we finally managed to achieve what at the times seemed impossible to protect the Good Friday Belfast Agreement in all its parts, to avoid a hard border on the island of Ireland, to preserve the integrity of the uh, EU single market while ensuring that the UK as a whole leaves both the EU single market and customs union as demanded by Prime Minister Boris Johnson. So we managed to square that circle with a hard-fought solution, the protocol. And this solution was shaped agreed and signed together by both sides. But if it is to work in practice, then the protocol needs to be properly implemented. We have had our fair share of surprises in recent months, even though the protocol entered into force over 17 months ago. So the UK must now show unwavering commitment to the implementation of the protocol, as opposed to continuously putting it into doubt. There must be a genuine determination to make the protocol work rather than looking for ways to erode it. And there must be an end to damaging unilateral action in favor of joint action through joint bodies. I welcome that uh, the UK is recognizing the value of this approach on uh, one of the outstanding issues, the supply of chilled meats from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. Because what the protocol truly embodies is trust. It marks the first time that the EU has entrusted the control of its economic border to an outside partner. In practice, we agreed to adjust the rules of the single market uh, for the sake of a compromise beneficial to Northern Ireland, allowing it to stay inside the single market for goods. This is a major concession from the EU, made uh, with an eye firmly on protecting stability in Northern Ireland. On its side, the UK agreed that Northern Ireland would remain aligned with the EU rules on goods, accepting that this would mean checks on goods moving between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Everyone around the table understood what uh, these compromises meant in practice. The EU will not and cannot accept this delicate balance being unilaterally changed or disapplied because of buyer's remorse. I am, of course, uh, acutely aware of how some in Northern Ireland feel about the protocol. I know and understand the complexity of identity in Northern Ireland. On that point, uh, let there be no doubt that the protocol has no impact whatsoever on the constitutional status of Northern Ireland. This is made clear in the first uh, article uh, of the protocol. And it should be even more evident uh, when I say that contrary to what uh, some suggest, the EU has no interest in interfering in the UK's internal affairs. I'm also acutely aware of uh, some of the issues we are currently seeing in the implementation of protocol in particular when it comes to controls of goods between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. 
That is why I continue to speak regularly to businesses, civil society, and uh, politicians in Northern Ireland to have a full understanding of the situations on the ground. That is why we warn against divisive politics. And that is why the EU has shown from the very beginning that we are willing to find creative solutions when required. For instance, we stand ready to go beyond the flexibilities in existing EU law on the continued supply of medicines to Northern Ireland, something I personally take very seriously in uh, this time of pandemic. This is my direct response to those in the UK suggesting that the EU is too legalistic, ideological, or inflexible. We turn our rules upside down and inside out to find solid solutions to outstanding problems. But these solutions will only work if they are taken up. Many stakeholders on the ground, for example, have uh, called for the UK to take up our offer to align dynamically uh, to the EU rules in the field of public, animal, and plant health. This would see 80% of checks required under the protocol disappear in a flash. I have even proposed a temporary deal so both sides can take stock when the UK's future trade agreements with other partners begin to apply. To refuse such an option from the outset represents somewhat of an ideological nature rather than one focused on a real willingness to find workable solutions. My colleagues in uh, the EU and I will continue to engage tirelessly to ensure that the people of Northern Ireland can benefit from the stability and predictability afforded by the protocol. Because at its heart, the protocol also represents an opportunity. I remain convinced that Northern Ireland can benefit immensely from having unparalleled access to two of the world's largest markets with more than 500 million consumers, a powerful magnet for foreign investors. So I want to see the joint held investment conferences to install confidence in the business community in Northern Ireland and pave the way for further opportunities. But we cannot do this alone. It has to be a joint endeavor between the EU and the UK. This should be stating the obvious. The protocol as a cornerstone of the withdrawal agreement is an international agreement. A commitment willingly entered into a set of legally binding obligations. Hence my clear message to our UK counterparts in recent days. We are at the crossroads. Now we have a choice of which path to go down. Either we are working together with the UK abiding by its international obligations and engaging in a good phase, or the UK continues to take unilateral action. If the latter path is chosen, I fear a downward spiral in our relations, which would take our joint attention off the strategic partnership. And in this case, the EU will not be shy in reacting firmly and resolutely to ensure that the letter and the spirit of the protocol are respected. Let me be clear. I would very much prefer that the UK chooses the first option, because our people deserve better given our historic bond, our shared values, our challenges that are global in nature. But our patience cannot last forever, and the clock is again well and truly ticking. I'm convinced that there is still a window for productive political dialogue and positive results, particularly in the light of the UK reaching out to us on chilled meats. And therefore, I trust that our UK counterparts will make use of this window with a vigor and perseverance. If we can do this, if we can restore trust, then the EU will continue to build a strategic, enduring, and mutually beneficial partnership with the United Kingdom. That brings me to my second key to success. This must start with full acceptance that the choices made in the past have uh, direct consequences today. We have inevitably seen some disruption to normal economic and cultural life since the start of this year. Lorry drivers facing regulatory checks at the border in Dover, or musicians facing visa requirements again 
as a direct result of UK's choices, even against our advice. In advance of Brexit, the European Commission had published more than 100 sectorial guides to explain the inevitable consequences of the UK leaving the European Union. Yet for many across the channels, they seem uh, to have come as a surprise. Of course, we need to find solutions where possible, but it is unrealistic to think that all barriers can be lifted. The very nature of Brexit was to put barriers back up where they had been previously taken down. Put in simple terms, Brexit has political, economic, financial, and even social costs. It will be experienced through its, through its disruptive impact. But in the trade and cooperation agreement, we have a good basis for strategic relationship. Here too, however, thank you. Here again, uh, we have a good basis for a uh, uh, to build our strategic uh, relationship. And uh, I think also in this case, uh, the implementation will be as important, if not more, than our past uh, negotiations. A key aspect of reaching agreement uh, on uh, the TCA was our joint belief in free and fair trade. Based on strong level playing field provisions to avoid unfair competitive advantages through distortive subsidies and social and environmental dumping. On the EU side, it is therefore crucial to monitor how the UK might diverge from EU rules. We will, of course, do so in the spirit of cooperation and dialogue, but if necessary, we will also be ready to use the enforcement tools agreed to in the TCA. The same vigilance is needed in all areas of sectoral cooperation, including visa fees, where the EU will not tolerate discrimination between EU countries. Of fisheries with no fishing community left behind in our efforts to implement the agreement. And police and judicial cooperation in criminal matters uh, such as fighting cross-border crime and uh, terrorism vital for maintaining security of uh, our citizens uh, together with solid and lasting guarantees for the protection of human rights, fundamental freedoms and personal data. Our approach remains clear and consistent to ensure that the balance between rights and obligations is respected at all times. We will make full use of the available instruments under the agreements to preserve that balance. I believe we should also seek out the areas where there is greater appetite for enhanced cooperation. Let me mention just two examples. Our massively successful Erasmus Plus program aimed at young people. With 73% of those aged between 18 and uh, 24 years having voted remain. It seems natural that they would want the kind of exchange opportunities offered by Erasmus+. Plus. The UK government unfortunately declined to join in, but our offer is still on the table. Foreign policy, security and defense is another example, as uh, this is an area that was supposed to be part of our new relationship according to the joint political declaration from 2019, but again to no avail. So there are opportunities uh, for enhanced cooperation, but as the ongoing European uh, football championship has illustrated, it takes two teams to play the ball, as is currently happening between Sweden and Slovakia. My third key to success is investing in our future. After all, the more prosperous and robust the two partners are, the stronger our strategic relationship will be. On the EU side, we are taking unprecedented uh, steps uh, to strengthen our union, and we will continue to do so. So making the European Union more resilient is not to the detriment of the UK. On the contrary, it is in the UK's interest to have a strong, like-minded partner on its doorstep which not only boasts the world's biggest single market, but uh, stands as a staunch global promoter of our shared values. And the same arguments apply the other way around. Hence, our interest in working in close partnership with our British neighbors. This is vital, especially in the world where democracy increasingly finds itself under pressure from many sides. Looking uh, at the audience, 
in uh, this hall, I have no doubt that the students of this college, whether they hail from the EU or the UK, will contribute positively to building a mutually reinforcing bond uh, between our two unions. To return to Margaret Thatcher, we want to see Europe more united whilst preserving our different traditions. Diversity is our treasure, unity is our force. Our strategy must be a combination of engagement with others, including the UK, and the pursue of the European interest. I'm proud to see that the EU's unity is stronger than ever. In the wake of Brexit and uh, in the face of the current pandemic, we have shown the strength of working uh, together as a union of 27 member states uh, for the common good. Since Brexit, we have launched a number of unparalleled EU initiatives designed and delivered with unprecedented speed, scope, ambition, and solidarity. The historic next generation EU instrument for the long-term recovery and resilience, drawing, drawing on the European Green Deal to make Europe the first climate neutral continent on the digital transition and social dimension of the recovery. A new industrial strategy based on alliances in the key sectors and technologies uh, like batteries uh, uh, as a collective means to strengthen our open strategic autonomy. The ramping up of our ambitions in the field of security and defense with dedicated instruments and an emerging new health union to strengthen the all resilience of our healthcare system and I could go on and on. To act autonomously, you need leverage. And leverage is acquired through joining forces, not in splendid isolation. Today's challenges like climate change, pandemics, security threats or poverty have no respect for national borders. Crises have often been catalysts for a stronger European Union in the areas where it is most needed. And while we cannot predict what the future holds, we can use uh, strategic foresight to help shape it. Your voice during the conference on the future of Europe will be equally essential to this process. And I hope to see as many of you contributing as possible. This is the best way to strengthen our democratic fabric and continue fighting populism. Ladies and gentlemen, dear students, if you were to go back to June 2016, few of us would have uh, predicted the situation we find uh, ourselves in today. But there is no use in endlessly revisiting the past. The decision taken then and subsequently have already been made. Brexit has happened and it has consequences. Arguing to the contrary is a fallacy. We must therefore look to the future and to rebuild an EU-UK partnership primarily based on trust. For the EU, and contrary to the doomsayers' predictions, Brexit has bolstered uh, our unity, unity among the member states, in the Council, and with uh, the European Parliament. Moreover, the UK withdrawal seems to have strongly dissuaded uh, populist rhetoric around uh, pushing the so-called exit button. The citizens of the EU want predictability and clear course of action not the erection of more walls in Europe. And they recognize that there is no such thing as a lone actor in global terms. Regaining control might be a useful soundbite, but it means little in reality when it comes uh, to interacting with the world. I truly believe that present and future generation of uh, Europeans, some of whom sits uh, before me today, recognize the potential of enduring partnership between the EU and the UK to build a better and more resilient future for us all. It will be a future in which we are not takers, but shapers, playing a full role in the world, with a trust as our main social currency, trust based on dialogue, mutual understanding, and the sturdy foundation of knowledge and evidence. Dear students, when uh, Portugal joined the EU, Mario Soares imagined the future of Europe in a troubled world as uh, one of solidarity and unity, one of peace and stability. 
with your talent, with your bridge building ability, with your active engagement, I'm convinced that each one of you, wherever life takes you, will strive to keep the European dream of Mario Suarez alive. Long live Europe and long live its college. Thank you.